Okay, Josh, take it away. All right, let me try to share my screen here. Does that look correct? It does. Very nice. Okay. Very good. All right. Uh, yeah. So uh, thanks to Mike for, for setting me up uh, for a, a, a lot of what I'm about to talk about. Um, we knew that in advance, of course. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll be talking about some of the, the PSF modeling plans uh, on the project side. So let's see. Uh, so. First, just a, a brief comment about some of the existing uh, PSF framework in the stack. Um, so, so the most, most widely used algorithm uh, in the stack uh, used on HSC, for instance, is, is this small modification of, of PSFX. And I, Robert can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong here. Um, and so we are running uh, one sensor at a time. Um, that's how, how PSFX uh, runs. Um, just a few, this is just a hodgepodge of things on, on this slide. Um, but so, so we know that um, to deal with chromatic effects, we need to do some kind of iteration. Um, so there's a, there's a chicken and egg problem you have to solve of knowing uh, photometry in order to get the SED, in order to get the proper chromatic PSF. Um, so, so we are thinking about that. Um, I think this problem disappears once you know what the, the SEDs of all the things you're interested in measuring are. So it's only early survey. Um, and then this is just my, my comment um, related to, a, to another question that uh, Mike and Robert were talking about is again, where do you put the uh, first moment shifts of the atmosphere and also first moment shifts of uh, for instance, DCR, um, and I just wanted to point out that I think the intention um, is to put things like the DCR or the, the shifts uh, into the PSF and, and not the, the WCS. At least that's where, where I, I like them to live. Um, and then just finally on, on this slide, uh, we apologize. We're working out some kinks we had hoped to uh, show you right now sort of some current state of uh, DM PSF modeling uh, that will uh, get inserted uh, later in the week. We'll show you how, uh, you know, some actual plots of, of how we're doing on, on real data with the, the current stack. But mostly what I wanted to talk to you about today was our goals for the, the future of, of PSF modeling in the stack. Um, so, so this is a very similar, you know, very much aligned with what Mike talked about. We want a full field uh, modular PSF, um, in particular one that's motivated by physics, um, where the PSF is a, a convolution between three uh, individual uh, components, an atmospheric component, and an optical component, and then uh, a CCD uh, component. So the, the advantages of this kind of model, uh, first of all, is I think it should be uh, more robust. So we can describe the full field of view optics variations using a fairly small number of parameters. So for the things that, that Mike was, sh was showing for on DE cam, for instance, I think the, the optics parts were being modeled with order a dozen parameters. We'll probably need more than that for LSST, um, but it shouldn't be a huge number. Um, and the second point here is we can figure out how to handle chip to chip discontinuities. And I think this is what Steve Kahn may have been alluding to in his question, uh, which is the, you know, you have a perfectly flat ideal focal plane, but maybe when you assembled the focal plane, there are micron level gaps vertically from one chip to another. Um, and splitting up the PSF into this uh, convolution uh, model uh, allows us to put those discontinuities into the optics piece allowing us to smoothly interpolate the atmospheric part 
over the, the entire focal plane. And then finally, uh, this model, I think, also uh, enables uh, easier or at least more intuitive modeling of PSF chromaticity. Uh, and that's just because we have good models for the, the chromatic effects of individual pieces uh, in, this in this modular PSF model. Um, that, you know, that we have some intuition for that that's not available, um, you know, in a, in a more uh, abstract PSF model. So let's talk about uh, discontinuities for a second. Um, so right, so current PSF packages, um, you know, work one CCD at a time, uh, in part because there are discontinuities from one CCD to another, from this uh, chip height uh, variation. Um, so on the right is the, the fiducial, if everything is kind of perfectly aligned and per there's a perfectly flat focal plane, optical PSF of the, the Rubin Observatory camera. Um, so, so you see this nice radial pattern, uh, you know, note the pixel scale. So I've, I've drawn one pixel uh, over on the right, the, the scale of each little uh, part of the focal plane here is 0.32 arc seconds. If I then, um, you know, change the heights of the CCDs between plus or minus five microns, um, then you get the, the following pattern. And so I can, I can, let's see, can I blink? Yeah, so I can blink back and forth between those and you can see what's happening to the, the optical CCD because of these chip gaps. Um, and then I can just tell you, you know, since it may be hard for you to mentally convolve this by an atmospheric PSF that's, you know, approximately three pixels wide, um, I'll just tell you that this leads to kind of order 1% uh, discontinuities in PSF sizes. And we need to, you know, that's too big to be able to interpolate over. We need to understand the sizes to much higher accuracy than that. And so the, the second thing I wanted to talk to you about uh, with this model is that it presents an opportunity, um, which is to take advantage of the long range correlations and anisotropic spatial correlations that we see in, in uh, PSF data that kind of the, the existing algorithms don't take advantage of. So like Mike mentioned, so the proposal is to use a Gaussian process with an anisotropic kernel uh, to look at these, um, you know, in our initial testing, uh, we're just using a von Karman surface brightness profile and using the Gaussian process to interpolate uh, the parameters of that, you know, elliptical surface brightness profile to see how we do. But certainly, other more complicated uh, parameterizations are also possible. So I think Mike showed the same uh, plot here from Heyman's et al on CFHT showing PSF elipticity correlations over the field of view. Um, you know, on the right is astrometric residuals. So I think you know, it's part of the reason we wanna uh, model those in the same framework um, is because it shows the same kind of uh, anisotropic spatial correlations. So this is from HSC um, work that Pierre Francois has been working on. So, right, so what is the, the actual modeling strategy now? So again, the PSF is this convolution. The optics in particular, we want to model as a combination of a, a static piece that doesn't change in time and a dynamic piece, which is you know, essentially accounting for flexure of the, the telescope. Uh, from one exposure to the next. And so we can construct a, a forward model uh, and then use a chi-square uh, kind of minimization or fit uh, to actually optimize the parameters in this model. So there is a, there is a pre-processing step before we uh, get to any in-focus um, exposures, which is to use donut exposures, which I'll go into more detail in a little bit, to kind of figure out what are the 
behaviors of the optical part of, of this model. So on a, on a number of donut exposures, we can fit the static and dynamic uh, terms and then essentially throw out the dynamic terms, keep the static terms from the donuts and then hold those fixed when we move to an in-focus exposure. And then once we do get to the in-focus exposure, the way um, you know, we're currently thinking about this is to iterate um, where in the first iteration, we might just have a few parameters to describe the optics and then something very simple. Uh, so something that's uniform across the field of view, for instance, to describe the, the atmosphere. So we, you know, we start there, figure out the optics, then hold the optical terms fixed and go back to the stars, fit individually now uh, atmospheric um, components um, and then interpolate those atmospheric components uh, with, uh, with the GP or, or with whatever, you know, your, choose your favorite interpolation algorithm. Um, and then of course we can, we can iterate you know, and improve the optical part uh, and improve the atmospheric part, um, you know, and as desired. Um, right, so I'm going to dive a little bit now into the, the optics. So the, the model for the optics is, is Fourier optics. So there are kind of two ingredients you need in Fourier optics to produce a, a prediction of the, the PSF. So if I want a, an image of the PSF for some part on the sky, you know, and here's the image coordinate, um, then I need to know what is the pupil illumination function. So for, for um, you know, Rubinov's, uh, this is basically the primary mirror annulus. Um, and then I also need a wavefront. And the wavefront is the departure from a perfectly a converging spherical wave front. Um, you know, what is, how does the actual uh, wave front compare to that ideal? And then you just plug into this handy little Fourier optics formula and you get out uh, an image of your, your optical PSF. So then digging deeper, uh, so what is the actual model now for the, the wave front? Um, so there are, we're splitting this up into to three components right now. Um, so there's a contribution that's from the telescope. So this is static in time. It includes things like the design of the telescope or any permanent imperfections in the, in the optics. Um, you know, it, so it should be continuous and static. There's a second term which is just for the CCDs. So this should also hopefully be static in time, but this is where we put all the discontinuities from one CCD to another. There's one slight complication, which is that because we have a rotator, uh, we have to keep these two components, the telescope and the CCD component aligned. So we have to, to apply a rotation operator um, for every exposure to, for our reference wavefront, the sum of these two terms. And then finally, there is a term for all of the uh, visit to visit aberrations. Uh, this should be, you know, this is dynamic. This is the flexure in the telescope. It should be continuous. Um, it should be slowly varying in both pupil and focal plane coordinates. Uh, I'll show a little bit about that in a second. Uh, and in fact, the, the kinds of variations here uh, should largely be predictable. Um, so in order to make some of the later plots more understandable, I've got a, you know, a, a quick primer on how we're actually modeling the wavefront. So we, we do it with a, what we call a double Zernike series. So the way this works is if you have the wavefront for just a single star, say, so we want to know W as a function of pupil coordinate, then that is a, you know, expanded as a series in these Zernike polynomials shown on the right here, which are just an 
ortho of orthogonal basis on a circle, or there's an equivalent one for an annulus. And we just measure the coefficients uh, of that, that basis for a given star. Now, if we want to model over an entire field of view, we just add another Zernike series. So we let those coefficients also be a, a Zernike series in the, the focal plane or, or the sky coordinate now. And so we end up with this double Zernike series to describe the, the complete wavefront. Um, so like I said, the, the visit to visit aberrations introduce uh, kind of only low order uh, double Zernike terms. And, and it turns out that um, you use fairly few of them, in fact, uh, in order to, to do all of that visit to visit modeling. Um, so the, the image on the right here is just um, showing bending modes of the, the M1, M3 substrate. Um, and um, you know, we, can, we can use those you know, first 20 bending modes in this case uh, to figure out what are the effects on the, the wavefront expressed in this double Zernike basis. Um, so so you know, before we even get to the bending modes, if you just look at the rigid body degrees of freedom for the camera and for M2, it turns out you need about nine double Zernike terms um, to model um, you know, what happens to the wavefront with these rigid body uh, degrees of freedom. If you look at the rigid body plus the first 10 uh, bending modes of M1, M3, then you need about 17 uh, double Zernike terms, and you need about 34 uh, DZ terms uh, to get the, the first 20. And so I, you know, this is M1, M3. I expect the M2 bending modes, you know, similar uh, things will emerge. I don't actually have that, that data for this talk here. Um, right. So, so now how do we actually build the reference wavefront? So this was this pre-processing step that I mentioned earlier. Um, so we can, uh, you know, in principle, use metrology obtained during construction of the, the camera and the telescope. Um, so we, we have scans of what are the actual surfaces, uh, you know, as delivered. So we could build the reference wavefront from those, or we can measure in situ from uh, out of focus exposures from, from donuts. Um, so on the right, it's just showing you a handful of donuts for hypersuprime cam, plus uh, a model and residuals. Um, and, you know, the, the model in this case, uh, has these Zernike coefficients uh, that we're using to describe the wavefront. So it turns out for, for DECAM, this is actually a lot easier because it's uh, an equatorially mounted telescope, it means they don't have a, a rotator. So uh, for DECAM, you know, the, the two terms in the reference wavefront, um, you know, there's, there's never a rotation operation. So these are just combined. Um, and you only have to infer one function. Uh, for, for the Rubin Observatory, we will have to infer both parts of that uh, reference uh, together, though. Um, and what that means is we, we have to actually go and do a little bit of, of linear algebra uh, in order to figure out the, the, the separation of, of both parts of that model. Um, so here's the, the math for that. I don't intend for you to, uh, you know, grok what's going on here. I just want you to know it exists and we've thought about it. Um, you know, the very quick description of this is we have a bunch of Zernike coefficient measurements from donuts at particular locations that we know, and we want to infer some model parameters. And it turns out you can do this one Zernike, one pupil Zernike term, uh, or one pair of Zernike terms at a time. And you know it, it boils down to some giant matrix of geometry uh, times the things that we know equals the things that we can measure. And so we just have to solve this linear algebra equation. 
you know, here's what that giant matrix actually looks like. Um, you know, so the, wherever we have a donut or a star, uh, you know, every, every donut or star tells you something about the, the double Zernike coefficients of the telescope. It tells you about kind of its own CCD where it happened to land. And it tells you about the, the, you know, the visit to visit term for its particular visit. So this is what that, that matrix uh, turns out to be. Um, and so we just plug through, uh, solve that equation, and, and we can do that, that separation of the, the different components. Um, so here's an example of that for HSC. So we don't have a lot of donuts for HSC, but we have about uh, 10 exposures worth uh, that we can try this out on. Um, so I should pause a little bit to describe what's going on. So each panel here shows you the amplitude of one pupil Zernike. Um, and then the location of a point in the panel is a point in the field of view of the telescope. So this whole figure with all the panels is a description of that, uh, you know, pupil and focal plane dependence of the, the wavefront. And so this is the, the telescope piece. Here's the, the CCD piece. So now you can see, you know, especially in the Z4 um, panel, that they're where the discontinuities in the model are getting handled, they're getting placed into this part of the wavefront. And then there are some uh, visit to visit examples. So here's the, the low order uh, polynomials uh, describing the, the visit to visit uh, flexure variation. And hopefully you can see that uh, animating here. Other visits. Ah, okay. And then uh, this last uh, animation here is just showing you the, the data, the model, and uh, the residual for one, one uh, donut exposure. So you can, so you can, data, model, and then residual. So you can see that, except for some outliers, we're capturing the, the data quite well with this model. Um, so again, if we now move back to in-focus uh, exposures, the way we can use this uh, is by fixing the, the static degrees of freedom, so the telescope and the CCD piece that we uh, inferred from the donuts, but letting for every in-focus exposure the dynamic degrees of freedom to vary. Um, and one thing you can actually try, and what we tried here, is instead of predicting the dynamic degrees of freedom, actually learn them from the, the donut exposures. So use the principal components of the, of the donut exposures as the degrees of freedom uh, in an in-focus fit. Um, and so that's what's done here. Uh, there is a simple, again, uniform across the field of view model for the atmosphere uh, also included. So I think these fits have a total of seven degrees of freedom, something like that. So if we're only having seven degrees of freedom, I think they're doing quite reasonably. Um, and then this, this last bullet point um, for, for the Rubin Observatory and uh, the SST, we will have uh, wavefront sensors, uh, you know, that are much more useful than the kind of corner uh, position and alignment sensors that are available on hypersupprime cam. Um, and one thing we haven't looked at uh, too much for either DE cam or simulations of LSST is how much additional information we can get by actually using the, the wavefront sensors as opposed to just um, in focus uh, stars uh, in doing this kind of fit. So that's, that's something we should look at. Um, here's, an, uh, here's an example, uh, similar in spirit to the previous one, but for, for DECAM, um, you know, again, a few uh, low-order Cernikes, 
uh, are sufficient to model the, the visit to visit. I think there are about a dozen free parameters uh, in this bit. And you can see from comparing data model and then residual uh, that we're capturing most of the, of the PSF variation in, in those dozen numbers. Um, right, and so, you know, like has been mentioned a number of times now, that the plan now is to, you know, after getting that optics uh, component to model the atmospheric component with a, a Gaussian process. Um, you know, the, the way I think about a Gaussian process is that you're really modeling the, the correlation function of your data uh, directly as opposed to, you know, modeling the, the data itself directly. Um, and like Mike mentioned, Pierre-Francois has been working on this and made, um, you know, a lot of progress on, on doing this uh, quickly. Um, and, you know, when we actually go to, to do an interpolation with this model, uh, the way it works is every time you make a prediction, that's a, a linear combination of, of all your data with the well, relative weights uh, for each data point set by the, the correlation that you've modeled, by the, by the model of the correlation, um, which is, you know, it depends generally on the, the displacement vector between where you want to make a prediction and a given data point. All right. So, Shifting gears a little bit, so I wanted to, you know, Mike already showed you all about PIF um, and that for DES it's superior to, to PSFX. Um, you know, the DECAM PSF model, modular PSF model, is being actively developed in PIF and we're starting to, um, you know, think harder about uh, putting in a, an LSST or HSC uh, mo module, you know, similar module into PIF. And in fact, we are, uh, you know, planning to integrate PIF into the, the DM stack, which I think is the right way to go. Um, so that last bullet point, there are kind of two things you need to do. Uh, the first is just, we have to be able to run PIF on, you know, Rubin Observatory images. So we've already demonstrated this, you know, uh, by Mike, you know, has this existence proof with the, the desk DC2 images. The second part, which I don't think anybody has started on, uh, is, you know, taking the PIF outputs and reincorporating them into the stack for, for subsequent uh, measurement algorithms. All right, and then I wanted to spend a couple slides on chromatic effects. I don't have a lot on this, but here's, here's a taste at least. Um, so we know in, in general that the PSF is a function of wavelength. And in fact, there are many different um, you know, places where the, this wavelength dependence enters. So some of the better known ones are differential chromatic seeing, um, or sorry, differential chromatic refraction. Uh, chromatic seeing is an effect where uh, turbulence in the atmosphere uh, blurs out bluer photons more than it blurs out redder photons. Um, so that gives you a, an effect. Uh, there's dispersion in uh, our camera optics a little bit. Um, there's diffraction, so the size of the, the airy pattern, for instance, if we had perfect optics, has a uh, a lambda to the plus one wavelength uh, dependence. And then I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on my favorite chromatic effects uh, that maybe some of you hadn't considered before, uh, which is are related to the absorption length of silicon and especially that absorption length, uh, chromatic absorption length, uh, coupled with the, the very fast beam of, of uh, the camera. <laughs> um, so on the on the right, uh, I've shown at top what happens on a for a, say a blue filter. You know we focus the beam right at the surface of the silicon, and the photons convert immediately. 
and there's some charge diffusion down to where they're collected into pixels. Um, something different happens in redder filters though. Uh, for one, their focus, their best focus is obtained when the beam uh, you know, vertexes inside the bulk of the silicon. Um, and then redder photons tend to penetrate farther into the silicon on average uh, before they convert than, than the bluer photons. And actually, because we have this very fast beam, converting farther inside the silicon is also means converting different uh, places uh, laterally. Um, and so that ends up being an important uh, chromatic effect. And of course, if you're, if you're not centered, then this, this uh, incoming beam uh, also has some tilt to it. Um, and that can, can additionally uh, introduce some uh, chromatic ellipticity to the optical component of, of your uh, PSF. So these are all things we have to think about. Um, and then just my last slide on the chromatic effects. I think it's important that, uh, you know, we keep in mind that the stars are, are relatively easy uh, because their SEDs, for the most part, form a one parameter family, so temperature. Uh, we have good models for many of the components of the, of the PSF uh, wavelength dependence. So I'm confident that we'll be able to infer uh, PSF, uh, you know, a chromatic PSF model. Um, and, you know, even if we're not taking advantage of our knowledge of, of how PSF uh, of Lambda works for individual components, um, you know, we can use the PIF pixel grid model uh, you know, additionally regressed on color, uh, you know, in addition to spatial position. You know, so this, this does double the number of parameters in that model, and so you start to wonder about if there are enough stars, but because, you know, the stars are one parameter family, I'm, I'm optimistic. The hard part, in my opinion, for dealing with a chromatic PSF is actually what do you do when you have a galaxy that you want to measure? Um, so, you know, stars are one parameter families, galaxies are many parameters in terms of their SEDs. Um, so, so you know, this is essentially similar to the photo Z problem. Uh, it is actually a little bit easier in that there are no catastrophic outliers. So if you mistake the Balmer break for the Lyman break, it actually doesn't hurt you if all you're trying to infer is the SED and not the redshift. Um, so the, the zero order thing we will try for this, can try for this, is to model SEDs uh, as linearly, linear functions of wavelength across the bands, uh, you know, using neighboring bands colors to, to create that model. Um, but anyway, that's, that's the hard part that needs more effort, I think. Um, and then this final bullet point, I just wanted to, uh, you know, raise hopefully for more discussion later in the week, which is that I think there's an interesting question regarding the meta detection algorithm used or being investigated for, for weak lensing. I won't go into too much detail, but I'll just mention that part of that algorithm involves deconvolving a small scene of objects by a, a PSF. And so what happens when each object has a different SED and then therefore a different PSF, I think is an interesting uh, question to, to start thinking about. Um, so, so that is basically all I had. I just wanted to conclude by saying that, you know, we should look forward to adopting PIF in the, uh, the stack. Um, you know, there is some room for a baseline chromatic PSF within PIF, but there's also all this other development on a, on a modular PSF model. Um, you know, and we're making progress on that model, but there's definitely still work uh, that needs to be done. And that is all I got. So any questions, please? Thank you very much, Josh, for that uh, description of the project's plans for PSF estimation. We have one question from Slack from Bryce. Bryce, I will unmute you. 
Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if the code you use to build reference wavefronts, if that's from the stack, or is that something that's in PIF or PSFX, or what you're using there? Right. What are we? So at the moment, that exists um, as kind of a, a separate GitHub uh, repository that I've been playing around with. Um, it's not in the stack. Uh, it's being developed external to the stack, but it's it's not in it's not in either um, the stack uh, or PIF at the moment. Richard, you had a question. Uh, you should be unmuted, sorry. Are you unmuted now, Richard? Can anyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, sorry. It's a bit of confusion oh. for muting. Yeah, for, for systematic studies, is there a way to um, request, let's say, a one sigma deviation of the PSF so that you can carry out systematic studies with perturbed version of the PSF. It needs to count for all the correlations. So with the Gaussian process, that should be fairly straightforward. Um, sorry. Josh, you unmuted? Oh. Sorry, when you started to answer the question, I think you were muted. I'm sorry. Oh, 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 it's okay. Uh, I was going to, I was just saying that, yes, uh, the Gaussian process part in particular is probabilistic by nature. So we could sample from the, the, from the GP as opposed to just using the mean of the GP. I think it's a little harder to uh, know what a one sigma perturbation is of the the optics parameters. I guess I guess if we're keeping track of the covariance during the fit, maybe we can do something. But I'm not sure how far I trust the, that covariance. It, it doesn't have to be a perfect one sigma, but just to get a rough idea on how the PSF uncertainty affects various things. It's certainly possible to you know, re-deliver the PSF having perturbed you know, one of the parameters in the fit. Okay, thank you. Richard, does that answer your question? So. Okay, we have another question now. Um, you're only known as Schechter. <laughs> Hello. Uh, Have to remind me of your first name. Uh, I think it's Paul. Paul. <laughs> Hello, Paul. Getting, getting confused Hi, with many names and login IDs popping up. <laughs> uh, so I have a question, and that is you've described how you're using the in-focus images, which permit you to determine the wavefront to sufficient accuracy uh, to determine the PSF then why can't those same in-focus images also be used to control the telescope? And conversely, if the wavefront sensors permit you to determine the wavefront to sufficient accuracy to control the telescope, why can't they be used to determine the PSF? I think, uh, you know, you could do both things from either data source. I think the main difference is, um, a requirement on how quickly this needs to be accomplished. You know, controlling the telescope, you need very quick answers. Um, but yeah, like I mentioned, one thing we haven't looked at, but we should, is how well can we infer the, you know, offline use the, the donut information from the wavefront sensors to inform this model. Um, it's not obvious to me what the relative amount of information uh, is in the in focus versus the donuts. Um, I just know that it's much quicker to analyze the donuts uh, for the online mode than it would be to analyze the in focus data. 
so your sense is you'll be getting more from the in focus data, uh, but you'll get it faster from the uh, wavefront sensors. Well, I don't know about the first part. The second part's definitely true. The, the first part, we're hopeful that there's more information, but I don't think we've proven that. Thanks. Okay, we have another question now from Steve Kahn. I think who's next on the list. Yeah, so let me just, before I ask my question, let me just follow up for Paul. We are investigating this. Uh, Josh is right that, you know, understanding what the best way to use both the in-focus data across the focal plane and the wavefront sensors is an active area of research. Um, you know, the, the, the out-of-focus donuts are only sampled at four points. Um, the in-focus data gives you continuous coverage across the field, but, but it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's, it's different information in the PSF than from the wavefront estimation. But the question I had was, um, actually I have two questions. So let me ask the second one first. So when you use the chromatic correction for the focus in the sensors, the, the beam actually slows down in the silicon. Yeah, no, I, I didn't put that in the cartoon, but yes. Okay, all right, as long as it's properly accounted for. That's right, we, we know that that's there. <laughs> all right, so the, the actual um, penetration is even deeper than you would naively expect. Uh, but it's still an important right. thing, as you That's say. Right. Um, the second one was about the uh, optics correction. So there, you talked about visit to visit variation. So what I was confused about is, are you assuming anything about those terms in time? In other words, are you assuming that those variations have some particularly smooth variation in time? or is every visit treated as an independent thing uh, when you do this? And, th and just as a follow-up on that, there's a disconnect, of course, because the wavefront data we have is for the previous visit. Right. And, and, the, and the correction then would be kind of in the next visit. So how all that fits together in time is kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, so I have mostly been thinking of this problem as every exposure is independent, but I think that's a interesting thing to look at is, you know, can we see trends over time, you know, modulo a big slew, for instance, um, can we, can we leverage that to even get, get even more robust results? Okay, thank you, uh, Steve and Josh. We have a question now from Massimo Dallora. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you for the, the great talk. Um, I have a, a curiosity about the, the expected degree of variability of PSF for, uh, for, uh, for stellar photometry. And uh, well, uh, both on atmosphere and optic side. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, that's a good question. I don't know if it, someone else online has a good answer for that. I don't. I don't think I do. Okay. If you want to check right. the back <laughs> channel. Okay. Well, thank you. Anyway. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so at this stage, we don't have any more questions in the queue. We have a few more minutes until the break. I'll just uh, ask again, um, is there, are there any more questions before we break? Okay, so it seems not. So thank you again, Josh, for that excellent talk. Yep.